Hi, everyone. I'm Cheryl Butler, and you're listening to the Mighty Mommy's Quick and Dirty Tips podcast, which will help make your life as a parent a little bit easier and a lot more fun. Welcome. Today's episode is number 482, Five Things Parents Should Quit Right Now, because there are many things we do and say in front of our kids that aren't exactly making the best impression on them. I just celebrated a birthday this week. I'm the mother of eight, so I'm certainly not celebrating my 29th or even my 40th of special days, but I can tell you this, I truly love life. And though I may sport a few, keyword few, more wrinkles, I am thrilled to be parenting at my age. And I've always felt that age is just a number. You're as young as you feel. I became a mom a bit later in life. This actually was not by choice, but nature and my body had other plans for me. After six years of infertility, at the age of 29, we were finally blessed with our first child through the amazing experience of adoption. One year later, I gave birth to our second child, and then I had six more babies. My new favorite motto soon became, be careful what you ask for, and I never looked back. Though I yearned for kids in my early 20s, I believe the universe knew better as to the timing of when I should have become a mom. Those extra years before kids allowed my husband and me to travel, purchase a beautiful home, and to focus on our careers, which by no means could replace a family, but because we were passionate about our work lives, we made it the silver lining of our infertility struggles. Nearly three decades and eight kids later, I've experienced a multitude of parenting ups and downs, but overall, I'm so happy to have learned from sheer experience. I saw a wonderful quote last week from Lesson in Life, which was perfect timing with my recent birthday. As a mom in my early 50s, I found these five lessons, which were in the quote, very appropriate while raising kids. If you're ever questioning the job you're doing as a parent, these five things to quit could totally impact some of your parenting choices. Five things parents should quit right now. One, you can't please everyone. Two, don't put yourself down. Three, don't live in the past. Four, don't fear change. And five, don't overthink your decisions. Here they are in more detail. 1. You can't please everyone. Years ago, if I were on a recorded loop whenever I was introduced to a crowd, you would hear, My name is Cheryl Butler, and I'm a people pleaser. Honestly, that truly is still who I am. But after nearly three decades of parenting, I have absolutely learned the very important lesson that you just can't please everyone. When you're someone who likes to keep everyone happy, the word that you'll often hear escaping that person's lips is yes. Whether it's trying to accommodate coworkers, taking on yet one more role in the PTO, running constant errands for your spouse on top of caring for the house, and of course managing all your children's wants and needs, there comes a time when something simply has to give before you give out. People pleasers like myself would rather eat live toads than have to tell someone no. Truthfully for me, it wasn't quite as difficult saying no to my kids as opposed to someone from work or in the various capacities I volunteer at. But I did get swayed more times than I care to admit into granting my kids numerous wishes because I hated to see them disappointed. Because I have such a large family, and I've always been outnumbered by my eight darlings, I did finally realize that saying yes wasn't a bad thing when it was done for the right reasons, but not because someone was pressuring me to cave and get their own way. In Are You a People Pleaser? Why Parents Shouldn't Always Say Yes, Susan Newman, Ph.D., believes that when children are told no, they benefit in very important ways. She says... When kids don't get what they want, they learn resourcefulness, discovering ways to achieve their own desires and goals. 
They also learn resilience, initiative, and grit, abilities that help children overcome challenges throughout life. In my podcast, Five Ways to Say Yes to Your Kids, I share tips on when saying yes is a good thing and how to balance out the yeses from the noes. It's human nature to want the best for your kids, but if we quit doing it just to placate or soothe them, we're helping to build character for them when they get out into the real world. Number two, don't put yourself down. When my kids were younger, one of our favorite ways to get ready for a nap or bedtime was to read a story from the Winnie the Pooh series. We're big Disney fans, so not only did we have all the books, we had all the DVDs, the posters, the Pooh Bear jammies, and of course, Pooh and Piglet stuffed animals. I just loved, actually still do, Pooh's innocent and optimistic take on life. Anything seemed possible when Winnie the Pooh was out and about in the Hundred Acre Wood. Of course, not all the characters in the series could find that silver lining when things weren't going well. Eeyore, that cute but gloomy donkey, always knew how to put a damper on things with his constant negative self-talk. If there's one thing I find harmful and depressing to watch, it's listening to another person put themselves down. Some people don't even realize they're doing it, but very often their self-sabotaging remarks are being done in front of little ears, their own kids. In eight conversations that you should never have in front of your children, Child psychologist Laura Burke believes that it's detrimental to speak badly of yourself in front of your kids because they could start mimicking this bad habit and start doing it to themselves. I wholeheartedly agree, and I talk about nixing the self-talk in my podcast, Busy Parent, Six Ways to Maintain Healthy Self-Esteem. I used an example about a haircut I got. Train yourself to dismiss the bad thoughts and instead replace them with a positive thought. For example, instead of framing my new haircut with, I can't believe I went back to bangs with such a round face. Instead, tilt the perspective with, I like how my new bangs showcase my big brown eyes. It's a much kinder statement and much better at building self-esteem, especially when you get in the habit of nixing the negative and replacing it with something positive. Number three, don't live in the past. One thing I'm very grateful for is my good memory. My friends and family often say I've got the memory of an elephant, and it seems I've passed this trait on to several of my kids. It's very helpful in remembering appointments I've scheduled, where I place something for safekeeping, and even recalling ingredients in a recipe I don't make that often. On the flip side, I also remember anything insulting someone has said to me, whether it be recent or years ago, what I was wearing when I was dumped from a high school boyfriend, and the excruciating pain I experienced when I had my tonsils out at age 18. What I love about looking back on a past memory is remembering something really wonderful that happened in my life, the adoption of my oldest child and then the birth of my seven kids when my speech-delayed kids finally started talking, the amazing family vacations we've taken to Disney World and tropical beaches. I'm grateful I can remember such vivid details, especially when one of my kids and I are reliving a special time that we shared. While recalling memories can be very important and certainly a lot of fun, I also admit that I've had times when I've been a bit stuck on something that happened in the past. And depending on what the situation was that I was reliving, that isn't necessarily a healthy thing. In Why Do We Dwell on the Past? The writer explains that an individual's personality does play a role in why some people get stuck living in the past. Another key factor is when something stressful happens to us in a public setting because we worry about being judged. It can become a vicious cycle, says the author of that article. We have a stressful experience in public. We worry that how we acted won't be accepted by others. And then we feel ashamed of our actions, justified or not. And then we just worry some more. The more shame we feel, 
the more likely we are to worry. The combination of worrying what other people think of us and getting stuck living in the past is a total drain of our good energy. One of my favorite episodes is Eight Ways to Be Present with Your Kids. I love the tip, live in their moment, which is when you totally connect with your child in their world. When was the last time you sat and quietly observed what your child was doing? Take a moment to watch your daughter running after your dog. Comment to her, Katie, you're so fast when you chase Molly around. Look how much Molly loves it when you hop on one foot to try and catch her. If you do this even a couple to three times a week, your child is going to soak up the extra attention like a happy little sponge. Tip number four, don't fear change. Change is one of the scariest words in the dictionary. It means that something's going to be different, and ultimately, no one can predict if different is going to be an improvement or make things worse. Often, change and worry go hand in hand. What if my new boss turns out to be a real ogre? How will I survive if my best friend starts hanging out with that new popular girl who just moved to our school? Who am I going to hang out with in the neighborhood when my only mom friend moves next month? It's been said that change is the only real constant. And as the mom of eight kids, I couldn't agree more. I don't always like change either. But through the years, I've learned it's much easier to embrace it rather than to resist it. Though a change does bring about the unknown, it also affords you some great benefits. It means change can be a fresh start, means seeing things through a different lens. Change makes you stronger and more resilient. Change offers personal growth and can bring unexpected improvements. And change also means meeting new people. Quit fearing change and be open to the exciting possibilities. It could bring you a lot of amazing things that you're not expecting. For tips on handling some of life's big changes, my colleague Ellen Hendrickson, the savvy psychologist, can help. Number five, don't overthink your decisions. Some people are just born to analyze nearly everything that crosses their path. If gas prices continue to rise, will this affect the holiday sales? If we get more rain late in the summer, Will corn and lettuce crops be harmed? She was a pretty good waitress, but she did forget my second diet coke. Should I tip 15 instead of 20%? When it comes to parenting, second-guessing yourself is easily part of the territory. But for some, it's an excruciating process to come to a decision. I have a really good friend who I absolutely adore. But when she has to decide on a matter, such as if her son can go to the movies a half hour early so he can play a few arcade games before the show starts, or if her daughter can join the before-school band rather than stay after school two days a week, it's absolutely painful to watch her figure it all out. Me, I base my decision on whether or not dropping off a bit early before the movie is going to be an inconvenience time-wise for me. She, on the other hand, would play devil's advocate and wonder if going too early would interrupt the dog's regular walk, which in turn would mean she might have to walk the dog, then dinner might be late, which could mean dishes would be getting cleared and washed when the news was on, and then she'd miss the weather report and not know if tomorrow was going to be raining, and then the patio furniture would have to be covered, and of course, if it's raining, the dog's walk will be thrown off two days in a row. Catch my drift? If you're an overthinker, and think it will be too hard to quit this habit? Try author Mel Robbins' simple life hack and book, The Five-Second Rule. The rule is simple. When an opportunity arises, don't think about it. Just count five, four, three, two, one, and decide. In Mel Robbins' five-second rule to fight hesitation, fear, and overthinking, she explains that when you feel the urge to do something, If you don't physically move within the five seconds, your mind will kill your dreams. Your brain is like an overprotective, irrational helicopter parent. It thinks it's keeping you safe when, in fact, it's keeping you from growing as a person, stretching yourself in your business and fully experiencing life. I love this hack because it keeps me focused and on task, 
and I'm hoping my overthinking BFF will try it and feel the same way. How have you quit a bad habit? Share your thoughts in the comments section at quickanddirtytips.com slash mighty-mommy. Post your ideas on the Mighty Mommy Facebook page, or please email me at mommy at quickanddirtytips.com. You can also visit my family-friendly boards at pinterest.com slash mightymommyqdt. If you have friends and family that would enjoy listening as well, I'd love it if you'd share the link to this podcast and refer them to the website, which is www.quickanddirtytips.com slash mighty-mommy. Here, you'll find hundreds of archived episodes covering a wide variety of parenting and family-related topics. Wishing you all a great week with your families. Thanks so much for listening, and until next time, happy parenting. Happy parenting.